Welcome to Chicks Who Fly, a podcast dedicated to women pilots and women in aviation. My name is Anaya and I am your host. I am a vocalist, a DJ, and a producer, and I'm also a student pilot. I am currently working on my private pilot certificate and While I am getting some finances in place to finish my training, I have decided to stay active in the aviation community by starting this podcast, among other things. I plan to interview and feature different women pilots and women in aviation and bring those interviews to you. And hopefully you guys enjoy the interviews as much as I enjoy spending time with these amazing ladies. Today we have Christy McFadden. Christy is a CFI, CFII, MEI, AGI, IGI, CPL, ME, and SE. Among the many remarkable things about Christy that I learned today, I learned that Christy overcame an intense fear of flying to become a pilot and a CFI. Christy also tells me about how she learned to fly in Japan and all the experiences that came with that, as well as what she would like to do with aviation in the future. So relax, sit back and enjoy the conversation that I got to have with Christy McFadden. Well, hi, Christy. Welcome so much. I mean, welcome. I'm so happy you. that you're here. <laughs> yeah, I'm super excited, too. I, I love what you're doing, and I just think it's such a great way to highlight the female aviator. So I'm super excited. Yay, awesome. I wanted to start out asking you what your ratings are that you hold and what you're currently doing. Well, currently I am CFI double I MEI. I'm also multi-engine and single engine commercially rated. I'm currently working, well, also I guess I should say I have my AGI and my IGI as well because I think that's relevant for for training for people who are thinking about what to do. Um, And then I am currently working at a small um, operation in New Mexico called Sierra Aviation as a CFI and double I. They don't have multi-engine there, but uh, it's a really great little little company, and I just love the people who run it. They're very pro-student. Um, so that's my newest gig, and I'm loving it quite a bit. Awesome and super encouraging. How old were you when you realized you wanted to fly? Well, that's kind of a double-edged question, but I I cannot remember a time in my life where I didn't want to fly, but... My, I guess I should backstory. My father used to take me and my siblings to the end of the runway by an airport at our house. And I have these memories from being knee high all the way up through my teen years. And even after I got married, we'd go visit and they would still say, hey, let's go out for family dinner and we'll go watch the airplanes land. And we would stand at the end of this runway and watch when I was younger, the B-52s come in and land. And I told my dad, I want to fly. I want to fly planes. Fast forward, though, and um, I got into my teen years, and I took a flight from California to Las Vegas, and it was so turbulent that even the captain made some comments that were probably uh, probably he shouldn't have made, but it really struck fear in me. And uh, and I did I I wanted to fly so bad, but I was petrified of it, just petrified. And every time I got in a plane, I was petrified. I thought we were going to die. I just never wanted to fly for real. Like I couldn't get over that irrational fear. Um, And then of course, moving forward, I married a military guy who moved me all over the world, including several um, years in Asia. So we had to fly across the ocean. So imagine somebody who wants to fly, who's afraid of flying, getting stuck in an airplane for 14 hours thinking she's going to die. I mean, that was literally how my brain functioned. Um, And so we got to Tokyo, which was our last time overseas. And I was, by this point in my 30s, I'd had all my three children. And I just was like, this is silly. I'm so tired of being afraid of something that people do every day. And I want to fly. And I'm just, I maybe if I understand flying, I won't be scared. So I talked to my husband, and he was like, go take flight lessons. They have a flight club here. Just do it. 
so I did. Um, and after about three months and a very amazing instructor, I fell in love with it, and I'm so, so glad I overcame my fear. So that's kind of long story for a short answer, but I've wanted to fly my whole life, and I let fear kind of control that, and now I've, I feel like um, – I've figured out how to overcome that, thankfully, and now I love flying. I want to do it all the time. <laughs> That's a great story of overcoming. Where Where is it that you were growing up that you used to go watch the airplanes fly in? So I grew up in a little town in California in the Central Valley called Merced. Some people will probably know it. It's the gateway to Yosemite. Um, and the Castle Air Force Base, which is now no longer an Air Force Base, was the, the base that we would go stand at the end of the runway. Um, and they had an air museum that my dad would take me to for daddy-daughter dates. So we'd walk around and look at all the old airplanes. And, yeah, I just, I mean, even talking about it, I still remember that sense of awe and wanting to fly as a kid and just it also really close to my dad and just his passion for empowering women to just reach for their dreams you know what's incredible is that we have so much in common with asia and all the stuff that we were talking about before we started the the interview but my dad uh, was a vietnam veteran Mine too. Oh my gosh. <laughs> wow, that's okay. This is getting too much, but amazing. Like awesome. Um, but he used to, uh, shoot from helicopters and okay. his helicopters were shot down twice. So when I was a little kid and he used to buy us tickets for trips, he would buy my mom and me tickets in the regular cabin and back then and I'm totally dating myself here <laughs> but he used to get himself a ticket in the smoking section of the plane right and that's how he used to deal when you were saying imagine being terrified of flying and getting on a flight to Tokyo well that's what my dad used to do Oh, I can totally yeah. understand. <laughs> yeah, I used to joke I was the crazy lady rocking in my seat. So I was always, like, so nervous. I just had, like, nervous energy the entire flight. And and it's amazing now when I get in and I'm super calm and I just – I'm, like, listening to the engine. I'm listening to the, the people talking around me. It's just a totally different experience. <laughs> Do you ever, like, pull out your iPad and – check out your own flight on flight aware or on for flight or something. Oh, I'm such a geek. I absolutely do. That. I will look up the flight aware potential flight path. I'll plug it into for flight. I'll watch it. I'll look at the approach patterns that they might be doing for the IFR procedures and kind of guess which one they're going to do. Um, but it's actually kind of, I know it sounds so silly, but it's, it's interesting. Sometimes I'll have people sit next to me that are, to flying and I'll be like you know just going about my business and they'll look over and they'll say oh, what are you doing I'm like oh I'm just watching the flight right like that's what I'm doing and they'll say oh you know what what do you mean I'm like well I, you know I'm watching where we're going and this is what they're going to do next like when they have an approach that has like a steep turn in it or something that kind of might startle a passenger and it's been interesting to see how it's connected people to what airplanes really do and probably not eradicating their fear but at least maybe helped them feel a little more calm on the flight just because I could say, hey, this is normal. It's okay. You know, like this is this is little bumps are normal. No big deal. Just relax. You know, that kind of thing. Um I don't know. I just it, it is kind of geeky though, but I totally I totally watched for like how much ground speed they're getting versus the airspeed and I'm a dork. <laughs> I I'm the same way. I'm super super geeky about all that kind of stuff and I tell people the same thing, and I tell them much in the same way that your car doesn't fall apart just because you hit, you know, a pothole or some bumps in the road. The plane is also designed to fly with these, you know, this little bit of bumpy air. You're good, you know? Right, exactly, exactly. And it's, you know, for me, being afraid of flying, part of understanding, like, how the airplane functions and works and aerodynamics and the interaction with air 
really helped erase my fear because that was what I didn't understand. It, you know, mentally I could see them flying. I knew that they were in the air. I understand a bit of the fluid dynamics of helping and physics, et cetera, but it just didn't connect. But then my CFI was like, well, let me just show you. Let's talk about it. And understanding those principles, it, it's so empowering when you can eradicate fear with, with knowledge. You know, like it's just cool. Yeah, and the fact that you for so long were so scared of flying uh, and you're now a CFI, I bet you it comes in really handy. I think and sometimes it does. I I have had a few students who will say something like this is this is a little bumpier than I like or and I'll say, "Okay, well why do you think it's bumpier?" Or my favorite is when we're coming into land and the site profile, you know, if in a high wing, if you're pitching down, maybe a little high, if you're slipping or something forward slipping, they get kind of you know, that you can see their heartbeat in their neck and I'll say, are you feeling okay? And, you know, they'll they'll admit this is this is a little past my comfort level. And I'll say, okay, well, let's talk about it when we land and let's explain, let's, you know, let's discuss why. And I think because I understand for me where fear was rooted, I, it maybe makes it a little easier for me to try to help them dissect their own natural fear and, and figure out where it's coming from and how how planes really work and how to avoid the hazardous stuff so that that fear, you know, can still be in the background because I think it's healthy. Don't get me wrong. I think it's healthy to have a little fear when you're flying. Um, But to feel more empowered about how you can manage and control your aircraft versus feeling afraid of stuff that you don't have any control over. Absolutely. You know, on my discovery flight here out of Santa Monica Airport, I had an instructor who – after like, you know, going up and doing a few things and he started having me do some standard rate turns and climbing turns and stuff like that. Um, he asked me if there was anything that made me nervous. And I was like, well, I think when, when we do like a bank that's a little more extreme, it scares me a little, a little more. And he was like, okay, so then let's just do that over and over. <laughs> You know? <laughs> Erase the fear. Yeah. Yeah. It, it really works, works though. Yeah. Well, and once you see that it actually, like, can function, I, I mean, I think for me, the idea of falling out of the sky was a real thing because the flight that I flew on that scared me the most was so turbulent. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if we weren't in, like, clear turbulence that day. It was mm. so bumpy. It, and, I mean, we were all buckled in our seats, and I literally didn't even think the seatbelt was going to keep me in. It was just – I remember the 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 real fear that day of how bumpy the aircraft was and, and that it could just fall from the sky. And in my head, you know, we see that in movies, and we people joke about it. And so that became my fear, that rooted fear that was really unfounded. Um, and so when my, my first instructor, he was like, so why are you afraid of falling out of the sky? I'm like, well, because we're big metal heavy thing and we're just up in this, you know, massive fluid and, and we're just kind of hanging up out here. And he's like, well, watch this. And he pulled the engine, right? You know, here's an engine failure. Ta-da. Pitches for 65, trims the aircraft. We're in a little Cessna 172. And I mean, we were at like 7,000 feet when he did that. And he set a timer. And we didn't even get to the ground. Like it took forever to get down to a lower altitude. And my brain was kind of like, what? How did, how did that happen? You know, it was kind of empowering to see or enlightening, I should say, to see that the aircraft could actually glide. And I didn't, I did not have a fundamental knowledge of that. I, my brain could not connect that concept with big metal heavy things in the air floating. And so, yeah, it just, you know, I think for a lot of us, when we have a fear for anything in flying, there's little grains of knowledge that we're missing or we don't fully con- have a concept of that if we did, we could override some of that fear that we have a little bit maybe. Yeah, I totally agree. And and it sounds like you had people who who really knew how to communicate with you when you were like having those sensations and, and that sounds really awesome and like it really helps. So it let did. me go back to when you started you were um your training, because I want to, okay. I want to hear what that was like for you. I mean, you're in Tokyo, but it was. Yes. I mean, how, what did, how did the language thing work? How did the ratings and certifications okay. and all that work? Well, I was fortunate because I was tied to a military installation, so everything I did was done under the U.S. FAA 
govern, governing body. Um, it did prove to have some complications. I won't joke <laughs> and say it didn't. Um, thankfully, I speak some Japanese, and I was pretty competent when I was there speaking. And so I could interact with the ground, the individuals on the ground at the different air bases that we landed at. But the military bases obviously were all English. And in the airspace, the majority of the time, people were speaking 100% English. Lots of accents, which I found to be challenging. Um, but thankfully, my training was done primarily in English. I had one instructor who was Japanese, and sometimes we would talk in Japanese, which was wonderful for my, my experience. But primarily, they used English, and everything we did followed the FAA regulations. Um, but I was flying in international airspace every time we left the base, and that was really cool. I feel like it gave me a bigger insight into how our our air systems work internationally, not just in the U.S., and I also did all my IFR training there as well as my private pilot, and so I got to fly IFR routes, and at the time, they were still using NDBs, so I always joke with my students that they're really lucky that the majority of those have been decommissioned in America. Um <laughs> But, but they, you know, we still had NDBs. We had rudimentary GPSs. They weren't the fancy, you know, Garmin 530s, 750s, G1000s that people see now. Um, and so it was, it was really unique. But um, I think, I guess one of the challenges, whenever we'd go into land, the majority of the people on the ground didn't speak English. The controllers would, and some ground crew did, but if we needed fuel, we had to use Japanese. And to fill out the paperwork, there's landing fees at every airport over there, and so we'd have to fill out landing fee paperwork, and it's all in Japanese. And so I got good at learning certain characters, certain kanji for what I needed to fill in, and um, my, one of my instructors who spoke really good Japanese would help kind of translate stuff until I had the flow down of how to do things. But there was times when I was soloing and I'd get on the ground and I'd plot my little Japanese to English dictionary and just thumb through things until I figured out the sentence I needed. Um, but I don't know. But your, your Japanese must have gotten, like, really good. I I only, when I was over there in all my contracts singing, I... I got very good at bar and taxi Japanese and explaining the fact that I'm vegetarian. In right, exactly. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I did learn a lot of unique terms that kind of fit with what I did. Um, I taught English um, in the local school district. I was one of their English teachers right off the military base. And so often they'd ask, well, what are your hobbies or what do you do for, for fun? And I'd say I fly airplanes. and that. I'd see blank stares on their face when I'd say that. And so I finally learned how to explain I was I was learning to be a pilot. And then once I received my private pilot license, I am a pilot. And um, it was interesting to have to, like, figure out the proper terms and how to explain. Because you don't say you drive a plane. You say you fly a plane. It's totally different. Um, anyways, yeah, it, it was – my Japanese got a little bit better. But, uh, you know, I think – more than anything, my love for that country really grew because I got to see it from a different perspective than just being on the ground as a, you know, sightseeing foreigner. I, I was flying in and out of airports in different areas, you know, dropping down over the Japanese Alps to go into Yamagata and, I, you know, getting to fly over the ocean to the little islands. It was just a different, totally different exposure than I would have ever gotten had I only stayed on the base, you know, and traveled around by car. Wow, you're giving me stuff to add to my bucket list. <laughs> yeah, well, I can't. I, I tell people do it if you can. Go to just go to any country you can and fly because you really do get a different bird's eye view, really, of that country and of how it's laid out. And there's a whole, you know, just flying in America, you see the different beauty from city to city, and you know, you take that to another country, and it's all these vistas and views that you would never normally get from the ground. I mean, I can imagine from my apartment in Rapungi Hills, I used to be able to see Mount Fuji flying That's above amazing. it. it. Must be. It was awesome. <laughs> I, my favorite was IFR flights where we'd pop up above the cloud deck and Fuji would be right out there to your left. And you just, and, you know, it looks like it's floating on top of water. It's just gorgeous. Um, that sounds yeah. absolutely breathtaking. Yeah.
How long did it take you to get uh, your private pilot? Uh, and then how long did you wait before you got your instrument and moved on, you know, to get the rest of your stuff? Yeah, well, I started my private pilotcy. It took me about, oh, that's a good question. Let me think a second. It took me about six months to do my private pilot. Um, I had a few hiccups because we we didn't have a testing center for the FAA written on the military base. So I had to go to, um, I had to fly down to Okinawa to take my written test because that was the only military base that had an FAA approved testing center. And then, um, so I had to wait a month. I was ready for my check ride, but I hadn't taken my written. So I flew down there, took my written, came back, and then there's only one DPE that's an FAA DPP in, or DPE in, um, in, in Japan. And he was based in Okinawa also. So the way that the military base would do it is they would get two or three people ready for their check rides and we'd all split the cost to fly him up and house him for his check ride, for the check ride time. So it was a little more expensive <laughs> than most people's check rides. And I was ready probably about four and a half, five months in. And then I, it took about six, six and a half months for me to actually finish it. Um, Everything in Japan is more expensive, so why? Oh, my gosh. (laughs) Right. Except for I was lucky. Like, flying on the military base, my flight training was cheaper. than like, my Japanese counterparts, they pay almost $1,000 an hour to rent a Cessna 172 and do flight training. And and I I paid a tenth, well, a little more than a tenth of that. I mean, it was really, really small dollar amounts compared to what what they were paying on the local economy. But... um, to, to answer your other question, I started my instrument training this summer. So I got my private pilot in the spring, and I started my instrument training almost like two or three months after that, primarily because um, I didn't want to. I didn't want to be in Japan and not able to fly. And there's so much inclement weather there with clouds and ceilings. And flying to the islands, you fly over the water, and when it's hazy, you don't really have a good horizon. And the pilot pilot it really made me uncomfortable to leave the shoreline and turn toward where I knew the island was, even when I couldn't see it, because it was about 20 miles away. So it was just outside that 10 mile, you know, radius of visibility. And it, it was just, I don't know, really uncomfortable. So I just felt like I needed to have that instrument rating in my back pocket. Um, and so, yeah, so I jumped in and uh, funding was a little difficult. So I, I had to do some creative creative things to get some extra money to fly with, like uh, I went through and worked extra hours, opened another business, did a pageant, like all sorts of stuff so that I could get money. Um, a pageant? Yeah, I the the base there does like a, a Mrs. Contestant pageant, mm-hmm. and they have a scholarship that you can use towards any type of education. It doesn't have to go directly to the university. Um, oh, that's um, incredible. Yeah. So I put a crown on for a year and <laughs> used that money to fly. Um, and it was a, it was also a really good experience, but uh, different and um, unique to be, to be concise. It was a unique opportunity, but it helped me finish my instrument rating. So I'm really glad I did. Um, and it that's... took me about a year, I guess, to answer that question, about a year to finish my instrument. Very cool. Yeah, I want to get my instrument immediately after. And I, too, am doing all sorts of creative, working my face off things to be able to finish my training. We have to sometimes. I mean, you know, there's a lot of it's it's difficult to find the fun. We don't always win scholarships, you know. And, you know, I, I feel like flying is not a cheap investment. It's worthwhile, but it's not a cheap investment. You have to be willing to put the money up front to see the return down the road. Yeah. Actually, the CFI that I flew with in Vegas and who I interviewed in the first episode of the podcast was talking about that, you know, about coming up with the money and being afraid, but it ending up being worth it. So it's very encouraging for me um, as I'm still in the process of right. working some right. of those details out. When did you decide you wanted to become a CFI and where and how did you do that? 
So um, once I finished my instrument training in Japan, I I couldn't finish any other ratings there. They didn't have complex aircraft. This was before the recent changes where you could do a lot of your training not in a complex for commercial. So I just flew for fun the rest of the time we were over there. And then my husband retired from the military, and we relocated to Oregon. And we p- specifically picked that area because there was a flight school there that had a you know program that c- I could use the VA uh, post 9/11 bill with, and I was able to actually use some of my husband's VA funds to finish my flight training. Um, so I went I went to Oregon, and originally I was just going to try to get my commercial and see if I could get like a low time pilot job and hash out hours, but I love teaching. I love I love seeing people get it. I like seeing people succeed. I I really enjoy empowering other people. It's kind of something that is a fulfillment for me when I see other people doing well and I'm in the background just knowing like I could push them to do it and help them get there. It just is something that is important to me. It kind of refills and refuels my life. And so I decided that the best way for me to not just get hours, but also kind of feel, feed my own passion would be to just teach. And, um, and so I got my AGI and my IGI first actually, because I figured they'd help me if I was teaching regularly, then it would make it much easier for my check rides, for my CFI, my double I, my MEI. And so I taught in the background while I was training and, um, and it did. I mean, it made a huge difference, but it also rec- helped me recognize I love teaching, and this might be all I do. I don't know. I mean, I'd love to do something corporate or something, you know, for hire at some point, but I really love teaching, and I love seeing people meet those goals they set for themselves and exceed them, and so, yeah, so it kind of clicked for me, like teaching and being a CFI was kind of something that I just felt was a natural progression for my own personality and my own training. That sounds amazing. It, and I think that I would really enjoy flying with you if you were my CFI. <laughs> Too bad oh, you're I, far away now. I hope we get some time. I hope we get some time. You never know. We might be in the same place. I hey. I do believe it's important to have fun when you're flying. And, I, you know, I'm I'm strict with what I expect my students to do, and I am somewhat of a perfectionist. Like I joke with them all the time, like, I'm going to hold you to a higher standard because it's the Christie standard. But then when they take their check ride, you know, they can be a little nervous, and they'll still pass. <laughs> That's my, my plan, at least. And um, and we still have fun, though. Like, we'll, we'll take pictures while we're flying. I, you know, I'll put music on sometimes. I I try to help them love flying because, you know, I'm sure you feel this way too, right? Sometimes when you're training, it's like you're in the nitty gritty. I mean, have you ever felt like that? Yes. Right? So it's like you're in the trenches and you're like, oh, man, like I want to be a pilot, but this sucks. Like, oh, this is so much work. And I had a CFI who also found ways to bring humor to our training, and she was amazing. It was my only female CFI, and I love her a bit. She, she really helped me recognize my own potential, but also – that we can make training fun and we can work through, you know, what we're going through in the trenches of trying to get to our pilot licenses, but we can also find joy in that journey and, and really kind of connect what we're doing to our own lives at each stage. And um, and so, yeah, she, you know, for me, that was kind of important. And so I've tried to instill that with my own students. Like, this is supposed to be fun, too. It's not just get it done and, and it's hard and it's horrible. It's you know, we should love what we're doing if we're going to be pilots. We really should. Absolutely. And when I have had those moments where I've been like, oh, my God, this is so much work and it's some of it is so tedious and some of it is scary, so I'm constantly uncomfortable. Uh, right. I, I've been, like, questioning at those points, you know, do I really want to do this or did I just, like, have temporary fever? And then eventually I always come back to, no, I really effing love this. Yeah. Right. I've had those little moments. I am, I'm a mother of three. My youngest, he's now 10, but when I first started flying, he wasn't. You know, he was a little bit like in, in a car seat still. Um, and there were times when I was working full time, in school full time, carrying a full load. So I had to be full time to get the VA benefits like fully mm-hmm. covered. And so I would be taking 12 to 17 credits a term, 
flying full time, working full time, and I have three kids at home. You know, I'm coming home at night trying to take my flight gear off and turn around and cook dinners and make sure homework is done. And, you know, we had my husband took a job out of state. He left while I was training. My my daughter got sick. It was like there was a lot of stuff that just happened. And there were a couple times I went in and I looked at my CFI and I just started crying. I'm like, I can't do this anymore. Like, I don't even know why I want to fly. Like, I'm just, I just can't. And then she'd be like, you're about to grow. Just wait. <laughs> and then sure enough, like the next flight would be magic. Like everything would hit. And, and I'd remember why I liked flying. And I, oh, I should digress. One time though, she actually said, she's like, you know what? Today we're not training. We're going to the beach. And she flew me, you know, we, we counted it as training because I did need to do some time building, but we just flew to the beach to, to Newport in Oregon and then flew back. And I needed that. I just needed like to remember why I loved to fly. You know what I mean? Like I needed that moment. So we, we're going to have those when we're training. Everybody is. But well, good. I, I'm really glad to be able to talk to other people because it seems that everybody feels this way. And I, I think so. all this time have assumed that it was just me. <laughs> Right. Well, you know, when I think when we're going through stuff, sometimes we do feel very isolated. And piloting, while it's it's a cooperative type of skill, it is still very much a singular skill set, and it really falls back on us as the single pilot who's learning these. We're the ones who ultimately are held accountable for whether we can do our training or not. You know, our CFI can give us all the knowledge, but when we get in that check ride, it's it's us showing that we can do it, and. I think that isolates us sometimes and makes us feel like we are the only ones dealing with this and how can anybody else even, you know, why does everybody else's flight progress look so magically wonderful and ours doesn't? And, you know, I think it's, I'd remind myself to take a step back when I was training and just realize, like, this is my journey, not theirs, and I'm, I'm in a race with myself. So why am I pushing myself to beat myself? That's silly. Like, this is about pacing and getting a good foundation. So then when I'm really, I'm like an advanced pilot, that foundation I have is solid because that's what all our piloting skills are built on is private pilot and instrument and commercial. I mean, we build from our base. And if it's not good, we're not going to be good pilots in the future. So why am I trying to make holes in my foundation? Why don't, you know, I want to fill them all in, not leave them empty. So, you know, I just kind of have to remind myself that. <laughs> That's a very smart perspective. I'm sure it helped you, it helped get you through like a couple little bumps in the road. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, I'm, I did have good support. I mean, there are a lot of people I've met in flying who they don't have support at home or they don't have, um, you know, people around them who are rallying them, which is why I think like, you know, our, our network that we have as female aviators is so vital. Um, and I have a lot of naysayers. You know, I'm a, I'm a mother, right? So how on earth can I justify becoming a career woman flying planes that's going to take me away from my family? I had a lot of people try to put the negative on me. But one of the things I learned when I, when I did that pageant back in Japan and then also kind of saw women through the years forward, um, kind of talking to people and being a spokeswoman, spokeswoman for people who were trying to become you know, a career, you know, trying to get into their own career or trying to just get out of whatever mire they felt that they were in, I, I realized that, like, we are the only people who can get ourselves out of that. And I can't let the negative be the thing that has the power over me. I have to choose to see the positive in what I want and recognize that, yeah, sometimes there's a little dirt along the way when you're trying to make things beautiful. you got to Sometimes get your hands dirty, and and that's the hard stuff. You know, that's the stuff that makes it rough. And then we get through it, and to da everything looks shiny and wonderful. And then we find another rough patch that we get dirty in, and we do it all over. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> do you have any advice for uh, student pilots and people who are still working towards their aviation goals? I do, actually. And I mean, I'm probably smattered in this interview just because it's my personality to speak and not think all the time. But um, my biggest advice to people is find your passion in aviation. Like, what is it that's driving you to do this? And maybe what your passion is, is you want to be a airline pilot. Nationwide, you've always looked for planes. Maybe your passion is you want to stand for women's empowerment. Like, we all have 
something about aviation that empowers us and, and makes us passionate for why we do it. And and don't let that don't lose sight of that. And don't take yourself too seriously. Like we we're gonna make mistakes. We're we're going to do things wrong and have some fun with it. Like find the joy in the journey because it's really easy to just to get bogged down. And then if you're not finding the joy in the journey, it's really easy to give up. And our journeys aren't beautiful, right? That's why we talk about like the scenic routes on trips. You can take the scenic route or you can take the road that's having the road construction. I mean, we, ha- we all have different different ways to get there. But in the end, the destination's the same. It's, it's all the same. And we each have our own timeline. So it don't, doesn't matter if you're 18 starting out, 16, 20, 30, 35, 50. I mean, we all... We all have a time in our life where this will become our passion, and there are people who will always oppose that, and there's people who are always going to tell you you can't because you're a woman or because you're a mother or because you're too old or you're too young or you didn't do good in math. I mean, there's all these reasons people will throw out there, but those reasons, they really aren't true because the truth is we have that power to overcome any obstacle if we want to. So as a student, when you're feeling like, I just can't do this, Give yourself a deep breath. Take a step back. Find your passion. Find your joy. Take a fun flight, but rekindle the reason and and then go for it and don't give up. Um, and then I guess my only other word of advice is just remember that your CFI probably told you the right thing to do. <laughs> so listen to your CFI. Um, <laughs> I think there's times when I didn't want to listen to mine, but um, he was always right or she was always right. Um, and then... The last thing is just, you know, be true to yourself as a pilot and as an individual, as a student. Be true to who you are, and everything else will fall into place in the long run. And and reach out to your network. Use your people. Yeah, I guess that's a lot of stuff, but... But it's all really good advice. Thank you. (laughs) You mentioned, like, taking a fun flight. I wanted to ask you... um, what is the favorite flight that you've ever flown? Oh, good heavens. You know, I will, I have to admit my favorite flights have all been in Japan. That's, that they've all been the highlights because partly probably because they were my beginning flights and so they were super impressionable. But, um, I have two flights that I made. One where I flew from Tokyo to Shikoku Island and we, we stopped in Osaka on the way and on the way back, um, I had a friend of mine that was flying with me, and we were switching legs. That was the plan originally, and um, we were doing our instrument training, and we ended up not being able to divert on the way back, and or well, not even not divert. We couldn't land at our original first leg due to thunderstorms, and so I ended up flying three and a half plus hours back under the hood in at, well in and out of the hood because we were in actual IFR, and it was hot and miserable. And it sounds really funny, like, why is this my favorite flight? But my instructor pushed me so hard and he kept saying, you know, you know, you can, you can do this, blah, blah, blah. And I I got to this point where I was about to break. Like it was so stressful. I'd only been flying instrument for maybe three or four weeks at that point. And so I was really new to it and it was just so much, but I got to the end and I told my instructor, and this probably, I probably shouldn't say this on a recording, but I told my instructor, I think I'm going to punch you because he was driving me crazy and he started clapping and he's like, oh, we found your breaking point. Congratulations. And it was like three hours, 32 minutes and 29 seconds, something like that, you know, like he'd been timing it. And it was like all of a sudden I wasn't angry anymore. I was kind of amused at myself for letting, letting the flight get ahead of me instead of being ahead of it. And, and the rest of like the last 15 minutes before we landed, I was like so at peace and I felt so much more confident. And I remember that flight and I, I loved it in the end. During the flight, I hated it, but I loved it. Um, and my other favorite flight was just flying along the coast and looking at like the castles and we'd fly down along the ocean when, you know, kind of low because you're out over open water and we you know follow the dolphin pods and just do fun stuff like that. And those those are kind of ones that capture my memories. And then putting my kids in the cockpit with me, like after I earned my private pilot and then putting my kids in there and flying with them and hearing them exclaim, like, 
oh, this is amazing, Mom. Like, oh, my gosh, you're so awesome. Look at, we can see the castle. Look how high up we are. Oh, we can see our house. And, and hearing them see the world and, and realizing how, how small it really is, even though it's so big, like those flights, I love them. Like I can, I can categorize them in my head and remember every single one. Um, so I know, I don't know if those are considered fun flights, but those are flights that I loved and I remember. I feel like I just lived through them with you. It sounds like really cool. I don't have kids, but I'm sure uh, my husband and I have three cats. Oh, put the cats in the plane. I'm sure they'd love it. Well, maybe not. (laughs) Put them in kennels in the plane. No, maybe if we get a dog, they'll they'll enjoy it more. (laughs) Yeah, I think I think dogs take to aviation a little bit better than cats. But you know, it's I think for me, like what connects flying and what makes flying something I love so much is seeing how it touches other people, like seeing how it touches other people's lives. And again, that kind of loops back to why I love being a CFI. But, you know, I've taken friends up in planes with me, people who have never flown in a small aircraft I've been able to take up and give them an opportunity to fly a plane in a safe environment. And that look of wonder and that sparkle and that excitement when they get on the ground, they realize that they controlled the airplane. They did a turn. They did a climb. You know, they helped land. It, it, it's just something that makes me feel so happy, but it also reminds me how connected we all are and, like, our talents and our skills can really impact other people if we let them. And being a pilot, that is a talent and a skill. And, and so, yeah, I just, I don't know. Those, those are the kind of things that I feel like, we can give back with with our experiences. That's very inspiring, and it's definitely part of what has drawn me to to aviation and to want to do this. But do you, you think know, you'll go to the CFI, or do you think you'll go to the airlines? Like, what are you wanting? Hmm. Well, I think unlike a lot of the people around me, like I actually don't like teaching because I don't uh-huh. like repeating myself. <laughs> um, I think I, I think words reduce the profoundness of an experience. So then it annoys me to have to put things in words. <laughs> <laughs> I can see that. Yeah. Uh, so I don't know. I, I, I've thought that I'd like to do like work with, do something like work with a charter company, but there's also another project that I'm, that I really want to do that I've already bought the domain name for. If I got to live my life flying and making music, I might explode and die just from sheer happiness. <laughs> right. It's like when it, merging the two passions that you have together, that would be so cool. Uh, if, yeah. you ever, if you ever do that, I will come sing with you. I'm not probably as good as you are, but I love to sing, and uh, I will come. I play keyboard, so we do something. We'll make it happen. <laughs> oh, yeah, we should definitely. <laughs> right? Yeah. That would be awesome. I know. It would be so cool. I hope, I really hope you can make that come to fruition, and you might be able to. You know, that's the thing. Aviation has so many unique facets, and you could totally merge those two passions together. And I just think what, I can't believe when I go out in the world nowadays, what people think is acceptable treatment of each other. Oh, gosh, I know. (laughs) And I think adventure and travel and learning things are things that expand you and make you a better person and a more empathetic person who can connect with more different sorts of people. Yeah, exactly. So that's what is important about aviation for me. That sounds so cool. And it's and that is something aviation feeds. I mean, that's it brings like I said before, it makes the world seem so small when you know that like in two hours you can fly and be three states over or one state over or you know what I mean? And when you start You don't even have to go that far. No. When I when I fly here and I see how long it takes me to get from Santa Monica to Van Nuys in a car. And, uh-huh. and right. then how long it takes me to, like, we're already over the Santa Monica Pier. What the hell? You know? You're like, that was five minutes. How'd that happen? I, <laughs> that is really funny, actually. 
I know, but the thing is, each like even in the U.S., we have such diverse culture for every place we are. Like I flew in Oregon, I've flown in Cal- California, I've flown in Idaho, Utah, and now New Mexico and Washington, I guess. But I mean, everywhere I go, I feel like I'm learning something new and I'm, I'm seeing the world from the, that culture, that area. And you get out of the airplane, you go to the restaurant nearby and you can get what's local. You know, like it's, it makes you see the world totally differently. And my goal, like my dream dream down the road, I would like to open a nonprofit that takes at risk individuals and um, battered women and give them rehabilitation, and part of it is through bringing them up in the sky and showing them, like, how big and yet how small the world really is, and then, like, showing them that they can be a part of the change, like, they can affect the change, you know. You're giving me goosebumps because on my way to L.A. today, I, I moved to Palm Springs, and I but I still work in L.A., and Today we also have a 99s meeting here, so awesome. I spend a, f- a few days a week um, in Los Angeles. But on my way here, I was talking to my mom and my dad being a Vietnam veteran, I don't know how yours was or how long he was back when they had you, but I grew up with someone who had severe PTSD, PTSD. who would have flashbacks yeah. and when I was driving here today, my mom was sharing with me, like, all the things that she survived in her relationship. It was really amazing to hear my mom talk about these things now and yeah. now that I'm an adult and, and, and hear how she found her strength. But I think that if you put a battered woman in an airplane, the confidence that could come with that exactly. is life-changing. It is. And I mean, I teach, you probably saw it on my Facebook page, but I teach self-defense martial arts. That's before I became a pilot. That's part of what I did. And um, so I always teach self-defense seminars quarterly for women. And that's kind of where this brainchild came from was, you know, I, I teach people how to eat right. That's one of my jobs. That's what I used to do. I I know how to do self-defense. Now I've learned how to fly. And I've met people who have skills I don't have, women and men, who who like to give back. And I just have this idea of like making a collective where we bring all those skills together and, and create an environment where people can come, you know, veterans with PTSD who are trying to find a a skill set that they can actually take and use battered women who are trying to find confidence again and believe in themselves. Children who have grown up in homes where, you know, they, they may or may not go on the street if they're not given the right opportunities, but if we could give them those opportunities and help them see, like, look how big the world is. Look how much you can do in such a small amount of time. Get up in a plane. Take a flight. Look at the, look at the connection you're making, how quick it's happening, and, like, help them, I don't know, just realize their potential and see that not all is lost just because of what they've gone through and instead what they can actually do because of what they've gone through. I don't know. But anyways, that's totally off topic, I know. <laughs> it is Well, but not happen. because because it's some a way that aviation can change somebody's life. That's amazing. Yeah, exactly. And that's that's kind of what happened. I got my pilot license, I got over my fear and I was like, Okay, well, that worked for me. So and then my brain just started running these ideas and I've slowly over the last, you know, decade been putting together this concept and yeah, I'm, I'm not there yet, obviously. I haven't had the time to initiate it, haven't had the funds. But in my heart of hearts, like, if I could do that, a nonprofit like that, that would be my my happy place. Hell yes. <laughs> I like it. And maybe I'll be calling you and being like, hey, girl. Absolutely. I'm filing the flight plan. <laughs> right now. <laughs> Amen. Exactly. Oh, my gosh. I think we've got so much, it's, and we've been on the phone for 55 minutes. So. Oh, my gosh, I noticed. It's so fun to talk to you. I know. I could talk to you for hours. Forget it. I feel the same way. Would listen. It would be too long. <laughs> yeah, it would totally be too much. But it'd be fun for us. Um, yes. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm really thrilled for what you're doing. Amazing. Thank you so much. I am so happy that we connected, and I really appreciate your generosity in sharing and and just the support you've given me. You're very welcome. Thanks. And yeah, you just keep keep at it, girl. Don't let 
don't let yourself get hazed down with all the stress of trying to figure out your training. You're going to get there. Well, thank you again for the invitation and for the interview. And um, I'll look forward to whenever you decide it's going to be up and going and I'll, I'll listen. And that concludes this episode of Chicks Who Fly with Christy McFadden. You can reach Christy on Instagram. Her handle is at Christy McFadden. Thank you so much for listening and being a part of this journey. Please join us again next time on Chicks Who Fly.